Whether you're looking for answers to specific life questions or simply hoping to become the best version of you possible, welcome to the Mental Breakdown and Psych Reg podcast, where we offer insight, information, and strategies based upon research and years of practice as psychologists. So sit back, have a listen, and get connected with our hosts, Dr. Bernie Wilkinson and Dr. Richard Marshall. Over the past few decades, there have been many reasons for ADHD thrown out and, and proposed and, and really broadcast in the, in the popular press and popular media. Uh, all of these different reasons why ADHD exists, why the increase for ADHD, uh, everything from sugar to uh, red food coloring to mm -hmm. uh, technology, social media. Yeah. Do you remember the fine gold diet? Yeah, I remember the mm -hmm. fine gold diet. You know, that it was food additives. Right. You know? And then there's sugar has always been um, a putative cause right. of ADHD. And, and, and many of these causes um, come up as though ADHD is a is a recent arrival right. um, on the scene, and, and it's not. Um, ADHD is is not something that is unique to the last 50 years. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not video games, it's not technology, it's not sugar, it's not food. They, they may right. contribute in some way, but whatever this disorder is, it's been around for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Right. There are um, accounts from medieval literature, from right. medieval um, diaries and things, of children, explanations of children who sound very much like they have ADHD. Mm -hmm. Certainly this existed more than a hundred years ago right. in the in the um, neurological literature, right. in the child psychology literature, child neurology literature, because it was neurologists who first mm -hmm. um, explained this disorder. So it's been around for hundreds of years, so it can't be technology or video games right. or cell phones or things. Those things may make the condition worse. They don't cause the condition. Right. We mentioned on Monday, uh, on Monday's podcast, that we're working hard this week to differentiate between actual authentic ADHD and ADHD-like symptoms. That's right. That's uh, because those are that's an important distinction to make. That's the first distinction. Right. Is do you have the disorder or do you just have the symptoms? Right. Because some of the things that people talk about that quote unquote causes ADHD right. can cause ADHD-like symptoms in individuals who do not have ADHD. That's right. Or it can worsen symptoms in those who do have ADHD. That's right. Because we also have to remember that like. With all, as with all other disorders, there's a spectrum here. Right. So there are kids who have what we might call mild ADHD mm -hmm. that, that can be managed right. even without medications to severe ADHD that right. might look like, it might even look like a psychotic disorder. Right. Like there's absolutely no control and no boundaries. Right. So that's the first important distinction is do you have the disorder or do you have the symptoms? Right. You know, we talk about epilepsy. Mm -hmm. Do you have seizures or do you have epilepsy? Right. There's a difference. Right. Um, and, and so it is with, with ADHD. Do you have ADHD or do you have the symptoms of ADHD? Right. Mm -hmm. so, so when we, again, when we're talking about this, we are differentiating or making that differentiation because that is an important difference right. to make. Because we do talk about uh, in other podcasts, we've talked about this, and uh, you know, we certainly talk about it with our patients. That there are some lifestyle things that you should change mm -hmm. that could help relieve symptoms of ADHD, right. including improved diet, d cutting right. sugar, right. and some of those kinds of things. Fine gold diet and things like that, the elimination diet. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I would not go so far as to say that we're doing that to cure ADHD. No. We're doing that to hopefully minimize symptoms Symptom. in those who do have ADHD and eliminating behaviors in those who don't have ADHD right. but you know whose lifestyle decisions are making those right. symptoms. It's, it's symptom reduction. Right. Uh, it's not cure. Right. Yeah, so. So, uh, so yeah, let's, so let's talk about a couple of the things that we know or are pretty yeah. sure are related to the cause of ADHD. Mm -hmm. The first thing is, of course, because uh, we always talk about the biopsychosocial model. Right. Um, th there is a genetic heritability right. to this condition, just mm -hmm. as there is to, and to most this is going to be a recurring it, theme. They come from somewhere. Right. You know, we, we inherit, we always forget, we inherit our, our parents' body type, and 
their shoe size and their head size. I mean, it's unusual that you're going to be much smaller or much shorter than your parents right. or your other family members, okay? But yes, every once in a while there's an outlier. But we also, we forget that we also inherit our parents' brain chemistry. Right. I mean, where else would we, where else would it come from? Right. Okay. Um, we inherit their hair color and their eye color and right. shoe size. We yeah. also inherit their brain chemistry. And many of these disorders are related to brain chemistry. Right. right? So it, it's not surprising that there would be a genetic component. Right. Yeah. So if you, if you're a person with ADHD, um, the, the probability is, is that you, one of your parents probably have ADHD right. or, or some of those traits or characteristics. And, and it's so interesting because a lot of times when we're evaluating kids, the parents will say, yeah, he reminds me of me when I was a kid. Or, right. you know, yeah, he's just like his dad because right. his dad, you know, mm -hmm. starts projects and doesn't finish them mm -hmm. and, you know, all those kinds of things. So yeah. there, there are those similarities through the family. That's right. Um, about a 40... There's a 40 to 60 percent chance mm -hmm. if a child has ADHD that one or both parents have right. ADHD. So there's a, that's a pretty high irritability. Right. And, and, it's, and this is going to come into play really significantly on, uh, later this week when we talk about treatment. Because some of the treatment things that you need to do with kids with ADHD are really difficult for parents who have ADHD. It, it is one of the fundamental problems in treatment because mm -hmm. what children with ADHD need is a structured schedule. Mm -hmm. What parents with ADHD can't do is structure their schedule. Right. And so you have a circular argument here mm -hmm. and a chicken and egg um, right. argument going because um, you, you're going to have, you're going to need parents to be structured and, right. and have uh, firm boundaries and yet uh, their ADHD may prevent them from doing so. Right, mm -hmm. right. So, Which exacerbates symptoms. Right, okay, so. exactly. So so there's the, the heritability, the genetic right. aspect. Mm -hmm. Biologically, we, we know that there are some differences neurobiologically in children with ADHD or individuals with ADHD as compared to those who don't. Again, this is the broken record. This is aggregate data. You can't take an individual brain uh, or right. an image of an individual brain and say, that's the brain of a person with ADHD. Right. Um, it's, it's only when you pull together a bunch of images of brains of kids mm -hmm. with ADHD or people with ADHD and compare it to a pool of people who don't have ADHD and compare right. them that you say, oh, there is a difference. Yeah, you know, we, we did a, a study when I was at the University of Georgia uh, we did MRI scans, mm -hmm. and we discovered that the, in a normal brain, the right frontal portion of the brain is a little bit larger than the left, you know. Mm -hmm. But in children with ADHD, they were about the same size. Right. But not in every right. one of them. It right. was over many brains that we scanned right. that we found an average difference. Right. You can't put somebody in an MRI machine and say, oh, you have it. It doesn't work that way. Right. These are averages. Even when you can look at a scan, right. it's an average. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, so th there there are those structural differences that we right. can see on on pooled data or yeah. aggregate data, but you're not going to find that there was a, individual. That's right. There was a study recently reported. I th it was in the Lancet, so it must have been done in. It was probably done in the UK, mm -hmm. but it was a a large sample. Um, of children and teenagers, I think it may have been children and teenagers um, did brain scans, MRI scans mm -hmm. on all of them. And they found that five of seven brain regions, regions that are associated mm -hmm. with attention and impulse control, were smaller in children with ADHD. Right. These are children who had never been treated with medication, so it wasn't a medication effect. Right. Everything else was controlled. But we see these and these are differences that we saw 20 years ago mm -hmm. at the University of Georgia when uh, MRI was in its infancy back in the 80s and 90s. And we see those same differences. Right. So these are, these are not occasional or spurious findings. These are robust findings over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And we see the same thing over and over right. and over. And even as the technology increases, we see the same differences right. in the same structures. Yeah. So there are... There are biological differences, and one of the one of the commentators, not commentators, one of the reviewers said, 
For those who don't believe that ADHD really exists, how do you explain these differences over a 30-year period? Right. Um, there, there, are bio, there are brain structural brain differences yeah. in folks with ADHD. Right. Not damage, just right. differences. Right. Uh, another biological piece is the chemical piece, and you mentioned right. you know, neurochemistry. Uh, there, is, there is some implication for dopamine and norepinephrine. And serotonin. And serotonin. I'm throw serotonin Why into not? It, right? Because it, it, you know, we don't know exactly which neurochemicals are for are, are are in effect for any particular person. Right. We just know again on aggregate data, um, dopamine, norepinephrine, uh, serotonin to some extent, but primarily dopamine and norepinephrine are implicated, and, and which is why. You know, when we give medications, we, we're giving medications that increase mm -hmm. dopamine and norepinephrine. You know, Steve Pliska is a psychiatrist uh, in San Antonio, Texas, mm -hmm. and he's done years of studies of the dopamine pathways, you know, mm -hmm. the different neurotransmitter pathways involved in ADHD. And I thought, oh, here's a guy who really knows about it. So um, I, he published a book a few years ago, and he's written a number of articles. And I said, okay, now we have the answer. And one of the prominent lines in his book is, we don't, we still don't know the pathophysiology of, right. of ADHD. Yeah. We, we, we can't explain what's happening in the dopamine system. We know it's involved, mm -hmm. but we cannot articulate clearly right. what it's doing because not all people with ADHD right. respond to medication. Right. No. And, and so you mentioned norepinephrine, mm -hmm. okay? There's norepinephrine is involved in some cases, dopamine is involved in some cases, and we know that serotonin modulates dopamine, so maybe it's a serotonin problem and not a direct dopamine problem, right. okay? So um, although these neurotransmitters have been implicated, uh, none are definitive. Right. You know, we, we can't say with any certainty right. this is what the problem is. Right. We talk about it. Mm -hmm. We talk about dopamine insufficiency. And some talk about it with great confidence. Yeah. I mean, it, we do. Right. I mean, because, because when we give a medication that increases dopamine and 80 to 90 percent of people that you, with ADHD right. that you give it to improve, there was a study done back in the 90s about region, they used regional cerebral blood flow, mm -hmm. you know, which is blood goes where the activity is. Right. And these were adults with ADHD. Mm -hmm. And when they gave them Ritalin, mm -hmm. when, the, when the adults with ADHD were given Ritalin, they had increased blood flow to the frontal lobes, right. which suggests that Ritalin somehow creating more activity in right. the frontal lobes. But we still can't explain why or how right. or what it's doing. Right. So it, it remains a bit of a mystery. Right. You know, the neurochemistry of the brain is, it's a frontier right. that we're just beginning to understand. Right. Now, the, the last little area, of course, the, the social area, mm -hmm. uh, the biopsychosocial model, uh, we, we have to look at some mm -hmm. environmental and lifestyle related right. things. And again, as we said a little while ago, absolutely there are things that you do in your life, things in your environment that can mm -hmm. increase right. the risk for ADHD symptoms. And, and, and it's here that we should mention, um, though we will mention it again later this, this week, that there are circumstances, there, there are situations where we could take anyone, right. the, the most calm, the most right. non-impulsive, the most attentive person, mm -hmm. We could take that person and put them in an environment and, and, and arrange things such that that person becomes inattentive, um, fidgety. Happens, yeah. um, you could take, if you were sitting or if I were sitting in, a, um, in an accounting class, I would become, well, I would be fidgety anyways, but, um, <laughs> but no if, you, if, you, you if you sit in the class or in a, in a setting that you're not, very interested in the topic. If they're talking about things that are way, way over your head, or you don't understand what they're talking about, you're going to, or, or you have physical discomfort because you uh, you just drank three bottles of water and now you're sitting down and mm -hmm. you really need to go to the bathroom. You're going to feel fidgety. You're going to have a right. hard time concentrating and focusing, and you're going to look like you have ADHD symptoms. Um, pop a video into your 
TV, mm -hmm. get a Netflix video about some comp, like a foreign film right. with subtitles, mm -hmm. and then put a bunch of kids in the room mm -hmm. and, and make them watch them. You know, the parents want to watch this Franco Zeffirelli film that you have to, it's an intellectual yeah. exercise. Yeah. And you put a bunch of kids in the room, they're going to all start to get fidgety because there's no interest in what they're doing. Whether they have ADHD or not. It doesn't have anything to do with ADHD, right. but they're going to certainly uh, be acting out. Right. Okay. Because there's no interest. Right. Okay. Uh, so, so there are certainly things that are in the environment that can create ADHD-like symptoms. Doesn't create ADHD, can create ADHD-like symptoms. Sure. School is notorious um, for that, and and that's something that we're going to talk about later this right. week. Is that, you know, a, as the expectations in school continue to increase, mm -hmm. we're going to continue to see an increase in ADHD diagnoses or at least ADHD referrals because. Right. You know, it, it, when you're when you're expecting kindergartners to write book reports, which is completely developmentally inappropriate. Right. I'll just go ahead, uh, go on the record. Yeah, and say absolutely, that. I'll support that. I when, you're, when you have that expectation, you can have a completely normal kindergarten student, right? Who who has a kindergarten you know, boy, especially a boy, right? Um, who isn't able to do that because right. he, you know, a, a normal right. kindergarten boy. Should, wouldn't be able to do that and he's going to be off task he's going to be inattentive he's going to be fidgety right. he's going to be getting out of his chair he's going to be doing all those things he may not have adhd at all yeah, exactly. but he's going to get that referral it's going to look like it it's going right. to look like he does so yeah. when we talk about environmental pressures mm -hmm. we're talking about everything from the prenatal environment right to um adulthood right and so in the prenatal environment you can have exposure uh, to cigarettes cigarettes and uh, alcohol mm -hmm. and and other drugs um, um, after that, uh, once a child is born, you can have environmental toxins. Um, lead is the mm -hmm. one that comes up the most, but it's not the only one. Right. Uh, pesticides, and there's a lawsuit making its way through the court right now for um, one of those weed eater, th weed, mm -hmm. weed killer things. Mm -hmm. um, Roundup. Roundup, mm -hmm. you know, that it's, it's uh, damaging to the body. So, so you can have prenatal exposure. You can have environmental toxins. And you can have school, mm -hmm. you know, or, or any unrealistic expectation. And mm -hmm. right now we've moved the curriculum down so that what we used to do in first grade, we're now doing in kindergarten, not all children can handle it. Right. And so you run into that foreign film phenomenon of, right. you know, the kid is sitting in a classroom and this assignment has nothing to do with me because there's no way that I know how to write or read or, mm -hmm. or write a paragraph. And so I'm going to do something else. And when you're five years old, something else usually involves something physical. Right. Uh, not a physical fight, but moving around a lot, right. getting very fidgety. So um, school can do that. And then as you say, as you move through the grades, you know, kids may be able to handle the structure and the workload of, an, of um, elementary school, but they get to middle school or high school. And once again, we have a curriculum that's pushed down. Right. Kids are in seventh grade are taking algebra. Mm -hmm. And not all should take algebra in seventh right. grade or even in eighth grade. Um, and so you have inappropriate, developmentally inappropriate demands mm -hmm. uh, will also produce these same symptoms. Right. So schools can be an environmental right. uh, risk factor. Absolutely. And as we talked about earlier, food, you know, the things that food. you eat, you know, certainly right. can exacerbate ADHD symptoms. Right. Um, you know, we'll... we'll we should do a whole week on sugar, but we've done podcasts before on the effects of sugar and what what it does to your body, and mm -hmm. it doesn't it doesn't cause ADHD, but it can certainly you know worsen right. ADHD symptoms or create ADHD symptoms, ADHD like symptoms in those who don't have ADHD and poor nutrition generally. Right. You know, if if kids are on a restricted diet or not enough protein, not enough this, not it's not actually the sh Processed foods we have to be careful of because mm -hmm. they may, but it's right. over time. It's right. it's it's not the pro. It may not be the processed food. It may be the lack of nutrition. Right. The, it's the, the the nutritional things that the processed food is replacing. That's right. Not that the processed food right. is the problem. It's it's the same thing we run into with alcohol abuse. Mm -hmm. It's not the alcohol. It's the vitamin K deficiency. You know, mm -hmm. it's a vitamin deficiency right. um, that's creating the problem. Yeah, it starts with alcohol. Yeah. And so it, it may not be all these ingredients in food. It may be that people who eat a lot of processed foods aren't eating raw fruits and vegetables. Right. Okay. So um, nutrition is another issue. Sleep mm -hmm. is another environmental Absolutely. issue. 
kids with ADHD are notoriously bad sleepers. Mm -hmm. um, and so sleep becomes a factor, sleep yeah. deprivation in particular, Exer lack of exercise. Right. Okay? But these are not things that really cause it, they, right. they, but they will contribute to and exacerbate a pre-existing condition. Right, absolutely. So, All right, so there, there are things that we know that create, cause ADHD, are um, signs of ADHD, and can certainly exacerbate symptoms mm -hmm. of, of ADHD that we should be mindful of. Uh, because all of that is going to lead into the treatment that we try to recommend uh, that and we'll talk about that later this week. So. You know, one of the things we didn't mention is extreme prematurity. Mm -hmm. uh, kids who low birth weight and extreme prematurity are at higher risk for ADHD symptoms. Right. We, we don't know exactly why yet, right. but we know that kids who are um, 24, 25, 26 weeks preemies have higher rates of ADHD right. when they get to school age. So yeah. that's another issue that we need to figure out. Right, absolutely so. All right, well, that is yeah. it for today yeah. then. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, and forget to be afraid. Thanks for sharing this episode of the Mental Breakdown and Psych Reg podcast. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to follow us on Twitter and subscribe to our YouTube channel, where you will find all of our previous podcasts and much more. We would be honored if you would become a patron through patreon.com, where any donation you can manage will go to the development and creation of more content. Just visit patreon.com slash the mental breakdown for more information. Thanks again for listening. Have an awesome day, and we look forward to being back in your feed tomorrow morning.